Now, though, we begin live coverage of a two-day forum with historians and authors marking the anniversary of the British burning of Washington and the War of 1812. This afternoon's session, beginning with Andrew Lambert, author of Challenge, Britain Against America in the Naval War of 1812. The burning of Washington City. My name is Stuart McLaurin, and I'm the president of the White House Historical Association, where we are privileged to convene today for this significant event. We're honored to have with us today two members of the Board of Directors of the White House Historical Association, the Honorable Ann Stock and Mr. Knight Kiplinger. We're also honored to have with us today Mr. William Allman, who's the curator of the White House. This symposium commemorates the bicentennial of one of America's most critical yet overlooked conflicts. With the gathering of these extraordinary scholars, and experts in the history field, the next two days are sure to educate, inspire, and enhance our understanding of the War of 1812. The White House Historical Association's mission echoes the symposium goal of echoing the public on the history of the White House. And we are so pleased to host this day and a half of symposium here at the Association's David M. Rubenstein Center for the Study of White House History. This event could not be possible without the partnering and the support of our co-sponsors, the United States Capitol Historical Society and James Madison's Montpelier. We thank these two wonderful partners for being with us today and for the contributions that they have made to make this a successful event. We would also like to extend a special word of thanks to the Kim Art Company, who generously underwrote a significant portion of tonight's, of today's symposium. And if you're with us tonight for dinner, you'll receive a specially commissioned gift from Kim Art made for this symposium. The association is grateful for the support and partnership that we have had with Kim Art for 34 years in the production of our White House Christmas ornament. This began in 1981 and is a very significant part of what we do, given that the proceeds from the sale of this ornament go to support our work with the White House. Please be sure to take a moment to visit our shop, which is right across the courtyard behind you here today, as well as online at www.whitehousehistory.org to obtain the 2014 White House Christmas ornament, which honors President Warren G. Harding. And then finally, to our audience here at the White House Historical Association in Washington and those watching on C-SPAN from across America, we are welcome you to, these, to hear these 14 prestigious presenters share their work and guide us through one of the most significant periods in our nation's history. To begin our very full afternoon program, it is my pleasure to welcome Kat Imhoff, President and CEO of James Madison's Montpelier, to introduce our session one presenters. Good afternoon. It is so wonderful to be here. Um, I also wanted to say that our board chair, the Montpelier Foundation board chair, Greg May, joins us as well as many Montpelier board members. I hope you get a chance to meet some of our leadership. James Medicine's Montpelier could not be more pleased than to have this opportunity to help sponsor this next two days. And I just love the title, America Under Fire, Mr. Madison's War and the Burning of Washington City. Declaring war, Congress and the president exercised powers that were granted to them by the U.S. Constitution. And for our young country, only three decades removed from the first war of independence, the War of 1812 tested many of the ideas in the Constitution, and it called upon Madison to abide by the limitations of powers that he had so, worked so hard to institute. So as we commemorate the sobering events of 1814, this panel will be shedding light on the new scholarship and ideas about the origins and the outcomes of the war. Fittingly, I love the fact that we begin today with a discussion of the British context of the war. I am pleased to welcome to the podium Dr. Andrew Lambert. He is a Lofton Professor of Naval History at King's College, London. In addition to writing about British strategy and technology, he is the author of an award-winning 2012 volume on the war titled The Challenge, Britain Against America, in the Naval War of 1812, and it was just honored with the Anderson Award. So if I could have you help me join in welcoming Dr. Lambert to the podium. 
Thank you very much for that uh, extremely kind introduction. The award of a medal for writing a book about the War of 1812 is somewhat ironic back home because, <laughs> in all honesty, we don't know it happened. It's a great honor for me to be here today, uh, for which my thanks must go to the team at the White House Historical Association and all those who've managed to put this splendid event together. It's important, I think, when viewing the great events of national history to take a look outside and to see what everybody else is doing at the same time, where this particular set of events in this country fits into the bigger picture. And really my job uh, this afternoon is to situate the War of 1812 uh, in world history and to put that relationship between Britain and America and the wider world. The War of 1812 posed serious problems for governments on both sides of the Atlantic. In the United States, President James Madison's decision for war split the country. The Federalist Northeast opposed a conflict that would damage their economic interests, while the Republican center, South and West, welcomed it as an opportunity for territorial expansion and the address of other significant internal issues. News of the war reached a British government which had recently been reconstructed. Uh, the Prime Minister had just been shot in the House of Commons and his replacement, Lord Liverpool, was not thought to be destined for a long term in office. In fact, he would last 15 years as Prime Minister, but nobody knew that at the time. He was not thought to be a great leader, an inspiring figure. He was not a man with a command of the rhetoric of Parliament, or indeed a great public persona. He was not a heroic figure but he turned out to be a very good manager of a cabinet at a time when the British needed management because the king, the last king of this country as well, George III, was sliding into permanent madness and his regent, his son, later George IV, made a very poor showing on the national, let alone the international stage. We needed a leader who was solid, reliable, and made good, effective use of the resources at hand, and Lord Liverpool turned out to be that man. The British were in the 10th year of a conflict with Napoleon Bonaparte. The war had broken out in early 1803. The issues are many and various, but the British had been waging war against the greatest warrior of modern history for a decade. They had managed not to lose, partly because they live on an island. British ministers had little reason for optimism in early 1812 that the war would end well. The last great British victory had been the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, and since then, the British had hung around the margins of Europe, uh, annoying the French, and hoping that the rest of Europe would realize that being ruled by France was a bad idea. Some Europeans had seen this, but not all of them. The British were not especially worried by the American declaration of war. After all, the United States was then quite a small country. It had relatively limited resources, and it had no great reputation for having a large and powerful army, or indeed a particularly large navy either. What the British were worried about was the additional strain on their already seriously overstretched resources. I'll show you this slide just to remind people that the Louisiana Purchase is transformational for the United States. It, it turns a country which really looks to the Atlantic into one that starts to look to the rest of the continent not just west, but north and south as well. The war between Britain and America was, of course, a consequence of the Anglo-French War. It was Britain's strategy of blockading Europe uh, with extreme legal measures uh, that brought on the clash with the United States. After the destruction of his navy at Trafalgar, Napoleon had instituted a total economic war against Britain. His strategy was to exclude British trade from Europe and to try and bankrupt the British. Napoleon understood that the basis of British power was not men, armies, or even fleets. It was trade and money. If Napoleon could break the British economy, Britain would surrender. His continental system would harness the European continent in a war against Britain. They would exclude all British trade from Europe on penalty of seizure and destruction. The British counter blockade, the famous Orders in Council, 
did exactly the reverse. It cut Europe off from the rest of the world. So the Europeans had to fight a 12-year-long war without any coffee. <laughs> and there were a few other things they missed as well. The British counter blockade cut Europe off from Africa, Asia, and the Americas, and fundamentally it threatened America's economic development. From 1803 through to 1812, American shippers, merchants, and traders had made a lot of money being the last neutral carrier, the last country that could carry goods from the French West Indies to Europe through the British blockade. They were also trading with the British, and neither the British nor the French treated the Americans particularly kindly. The British would arrest their ships and send them before a court, and Napoleon simply burnt them. But the American government thought Napoleon was less dangerous than the British, or at least less dangerous to their interests. The continental system, not this continent, but the European continent, was beginning to destroy the economies of other European states. Napoleon protected France from the economic war by asset stripping all of the conquered territories. The first country to rebel would be Russia, Napoleon's only serious ally and a major trading nation with a big export trade geared towards supplying the British market. Inside the continental system from 1807 to 1811, Russia saw her economy collapse. Being part of Napoleon's team was very bad for your business. In 1811, the Tsar of Russia, Alexander, realized that if he carried on like this, his country would be bankrupt and he would follow his father to an early grave. The last time Russia had made war on Britain, the Tsar was murdered and they changed the government. Basically, most of the landowners in Russia relied on selling goods to the British to pay their bills. So the Tsar decided that bankruptcy and death was slightly less bad than being invaded by Napoleon, but only slightly. So even as the War of 1812 is about to start, the cracks in Napoleon's system are becoming quite fundamental. But the British haven't yet seen the future. In 1811, the long-running interchange of arguments at sea reached a high point with the incident between the USS President and HMS Little Belt. Uh, the Little Belt is the small one with the Union flag. A case of mistaken identity, according to Commodore John Rogers, uh, a case of deliberate aggression, according to Arthur Bingham, who commanded the Little Belt. But the British made little of it. They were far too busy doing other things. In 1811-1812, Napoleon is beginning to gear up for the invasion of Russia. This will be the great campaign that will decide the outcome of the conflict in Europe. Mr. Madison's war depends on the French winning. If Russia collapses back into the continental system, Napoleon is utterly dominant in Europe, what possible hope have the British got of carrying on? They will have to make terms. It will be possible then to negotiate with them on a range of issues. But the British wouldn't surrender to Napoleon, uh, let alone to James Madison. Uh, the main British army was fighting successfully in Spain under the Duke of Wellington, and the Royal Navy was protecting global trade. The British simply had no spare ships, men, or money to fight a war with anybody else. Indeed, during the War of 1812, the British military effort on land and sea was rarely more than 7% of their land and sea forces. They simply didn't have any more to spare. It wasn't a case of choice, that was all there was. So in 1812 and 1813, British strategy is defensive and it's largely reactive. The Americans had the initiative. They chose where to fight and how to fight. As we know, the United States opened the conflict with what should have been a three-pronged offensive into what is now Canada and a surge of warships and privateers into the Western Atlantic to cut Britain's economic lifelines. The Canadian frontier became the main military theater, and for three years, heavily outnumbered British regulars, Canadian militia, and native warriors defended the border. To meet these attacks, the British shifted some troops into the Canadian theater, but they came from the West Indies, not from Europe. The British moved no soldiers from the European theater until after the end of the Napoleonic conflict. As long as Napoleon remained in power, British strategy would be defensive. The border did not move. This was a long-running but ultimately stalemated conflict. <clears throat>
This left the Madison administration with an alternative strategy, the destruction of British floating trade and the wrecking of Britain's economy. A strategy that relied on privateering. The United States Navy was too small to do this. It needed the assistance of a large number of privately owned and operated licensed predators. The British response to the American declaration of war, there is the Canadian frontier, was the appointment of Vice Admiral Sir John Bollet's Warren Senior, with his red sash on as a Knight of the Garter. A diplomat, highly successful naval operator, he was sent to command the entire theater with powers to negotiate an armistice and an early return to the status quo ante. That was what the British wanted. Are the Americans serious about this war? Are they not prepared to think about this and just go back to business as usual? Warren's job was to do everything but wage war until he knew the Americans were absolutely determined on fighting. His command stretched from Newfoundland to Mexico and he would be hampered by inadequate means, poor communications, and very limited support from his home government. His defense of British shipping in the Atlantic would determine the outcome of the war, but only after the Americans had declared that they were desperately serious about waging it. Only then could he turn defense into offense, imposing a devastating economic blockade that simply treated the United States as another part of Napoleon's continental system, something to be blockaded and economically ruined. Initially, shortage of ships and limited rules of engagement hampered Warren's business. But even in late 1812, he began the difficult job of capturing and incarcerating the American privateer fleet. As British prisons filled with American sailors, the privateer effort would finally begin to falter. Only in mid-November, some five and a half months after the declaration of war, did Warren learn that the Americans were determined to continue the conflict. He was then tasked with setting up a fully effective convoy system to protect all the shipping transiting from the New World to the Old, from the Caribbean and from British North America into British ports. By this stage, over 150 British merchant ships had already been captured and more privateers were fitting out. There was money to be made in privateering. It was an attractive option in 1812. His masters in London, underestimating the scale of the privateer threat and rather ignorant of the length and complexity of the United States coastline, sent him very few resources. And what they did send initially were not of the first quality. They woke up when the United States Navy won three shattering victories over the Royal Navy. These successes in the autumn of 1812 made the British government pay attention. Here we see a constitution taking HMS Guerriere in Michel Felice Cornet's wonderful picture, which manages to disguise the key fact of the battle. The Guerriere was only two thirds the size of the constitution. It had two thirds the firepower and rather less than two thirds the crew. If the American captain had lost the battle, he would have made a very poor showing indeed. But that's not the story that appeared in the Republican newspapers. The, next, the second battle, the loss of HMS Macedonian, was rather embarrassing. The British captain was both blind and a fool. Uh, but HMS Java, the third frigate cap, uh, captured, put up a very creditable fight uh, against, once again, a far bigger American ship. The two defeats of the Guerriere and the Java were neither dishonorable nor especially disadvantageous. The British quickly got their crew back, and the one thing they were short of was sailors, as we all know from the pre-war impressment. While the American ships that had won the battles, instead of carrying on to destroy British merchant ships, had to go home for repairs. So at the cost of winning some glory, the Americans had ruined their mission. As Alfred Thayer Mahan said, these were strategically irrelevant victories, but they did provide the United States government, which had a lot to explain, uh, with some very useful propaganda. The fact the Republican administration had hamstrung the Navy for the previous 12 years made it all the more ironic that it was the Navy that rode to their rescue. The British government belatedly ordered general reprisals against the United States on the 13th of October, 1812, news that didn't reach the New World until the end of November. On November 21st, the British government imposed a strict and rigorous, and I quote, blockade on the Chesapeake Bay and the Delaware River. The British had read the division lists of Congress. They knew who voted for war and who didn't. 
So if your congressman voted for war, the British blockaded you and attacked you. And if your congressman didn't vote for war, the British left you alone. <laughs> the British understood that the best way to defeat the enemy was divide and conquer, not overwhelm. Because Britain is a very small country, we have no history of overwhelming anybody. <laughs> Furthermore, the northeastern ports were providing huge amounts of resource for the British war effort in Spain in particular. The Duke of Wellington's army ate American-grown grain. Uh, American food supplies also crossed into British North America. The good people of Vermont fed the British army in Canada for the entire war. Uh, to their enormous profit, one has to understand. Critically, the economic blockade was finally established on 21st February 1813, eight months after the war had begun. There had been a golden eight months in which it was possible to continue operating both peace and war at the same time. Ultimately, this blockade would be the decisive strategy. It would break the American economy, it would bankrupt the state, and it would leave it unable to borrow money or raise credit either internally or internationally. Quite simply, the United States would run out of money. And as everybody knows, the sinews of war are money, money, and some more money. And when you run out of that, you have to stop fighting. There is the Constitution taking the job. Unlike Cornet's picture, this, of course, is by a British artist, and it gets the scales of the ships. Well, that's actually not quite as accurate as it might be. The, uh, the Java was a little bigger than that. But um, it does look like the Constitution is shooting at a rowing boat. The decisive battle of the War of 1812 happened on the 7th of September 1812. It's the Battle of Borodino. You're all familiar with it. It's one of the great moments in world history, enough to write a vast symphonic work, uh, to inspire a magnificent novel, uh, and to bring down a great emperor. In a single field work on this day of battle, more Russians died than were killed or died of, of illness in the whole of the War of 1812 on all sides. This really was a titanic clash. Uh, of two emperors and two vast armies, numbering close on 200,000 men each. The War of 1812 would not be fought by armies of 200,000 men. In fact, it wouldn't be fought by 200,000 men all told. As 1813 began, James Madison knew that Napoleon had lost. His army was in full retreat. Indeed, it was in complete collapse. He had taken his country to war on the premise the French would win. They'd lost. Now what was going to happen? This also took the pressure off Britain, and it released naval reinforcements from the British fleet in the Baltic, a very important fleet, which had been keeping the Baltic open for British trade for the previous five years. Those ships and key personnel were moved across to the North American station. The British very carefully picked out the right ships and the right officers to send to blockade the United States. Their best men, many of them protégés of Nelson, one of whom we will come to. Furthermore, with Russian trade open, the British didn't need to buy any grain from the Americans anymore. The Russians had plenty of grain, and it was a lot closer to Britain. By the summer of 1813, fast British battleships and more numerous and better commanded frigates were available to blockade New York, Boston, and the Chesapeake. The United States Navy would find it very difficult to get to sea, and the privateers would not find it easy to attack well-organized and protected British convoys. Among the men who would arrive in 1813, none would be more famous and indeed more relevant to this conference than Rear Admiral George Coburn, a man made captain by Nelson, picked out as one of the stars of the future by the great man himself. He was sent over here very specifically to take the offensive onto the American coast and, I quote, accelerate the return of peace. We know what he did. These reinforcements enabled Warren to impose a naval blockade of the entire American coast in the spring of 1813, pinning American sloops and frigates in Boston and New York. This meant the threat to convoys was merely from privateers, so an escorted convoy with a frigate alongside it was safe from American predation. By May 1813, the economic blockade was biting too. New York, the largest American port, producing one quarter of the national revenue from customs dues, was closed. The revenue was drying up because most federal revenue came from import and export dues. State revenue fell to catastrophic levels. It was impossible to pay for the war. It would have to be paid for on borrowing. American government stock failed to sell at sustainable rates, a clear sign that something was fundamentally wrong. As Henry Adams observed, and I quote, the pressure of the blockades was immediately felt. <laughs> 
The war at sea turned in Britain's favour on June 1, 1813. First, the frigates United States and Macedonian were driven into New London by a British squadron, from whence they never emerged until the war was over. And then the USS Chesapeake, seen here with the stars and stripes under uh, the Union Jack, was captured by HMS Shannon in a battle that lasted 11 minutes, uh, the most brilliant, brave, and heroic feat of either navy in the entire war. Uh, the fact that Captain Philip Broke, who won the battle, was an obsessive monomaniac, meant that James Lawrence, the captain of the Chesapeake, had picked the wrong enemy. Against an ordinary British frigate, he would have done very well. But with those three frigates removed from the American Navy's list of ships at sea, the American naval threat effectively evaporated. The Royal Navy now focused on privateers, and by the end of the war, 6,500 privateer crew were locked up in a British prison on Dartmoor in South Devon, which was a particularly unpleasant place to send them. We built it for the French, but we ran out of Frenchmen, so we sent the Americans there as well. The British still hoped the war would go away. They just wanted the Americans to say, you know what, we're sorry, we'll just sort of go back and we'll stay just quiet. It was on the table from day one till the very last day, because that's what the peace treaty was. That's all the British wanted. In 1813, the Shannon action got the British quite excited. Here is the contemporary cartoon by George Cruikshank. It rather summed up the British view of the war. This was annoying, and they rather wished it would go away. But 1813 was not about America. It was about Napoleon. There was another great battle at Leipzig. In September 1813, Napoleon lost 73,000 men from an army of a quarter of a million. His German empire collapsed. He retreated into France. The writing was on the wall for his empire. The British poured money and munitions into Europe to defeat Napoleon. They did not send men or money to North America. British would have taken status quo ante any time. They defended Canada, but they didn't have any resources to do anything else. In 1813, George Coburn's raids in the Chesapeake Bay seized the initiative, closing down privateer bases, damaging the property of those who voted for war. At the end of 1813, the economic blockade was stretched all the way up to the edge of Maine. New England was blockaded too. This would promote sectional conflict. But British options were very limited. In the autumn of 1813, they had a chance to do something they'd wanted to do for 20 years, to capture the Scheldt Estuary in northern Belgium, the one place you can invade England from. So they sent all the troops they could find to do this, and they lost. It was embarrassing. They just didn't have the manpower to do anything serious in Europe, and Europe was far more important than North America. So the idea they had any offensive plans here it, it is untrue. Throughout the war, there would be more British troops defending the West Indies than there were defending Canada, because the political power of the West India planters and merchants was far greater than the political interest in Canada. West Indian commercial interests saw Admiral Warren replaced by Vice Admiral Sir Alexander Cochrane in the spring of 1814, and he too will feature in the war. As peace approached in Europe, the British Foreign Secretary, Lord Castlereagh, told the Europeans that he would not discuss maritime belligerent rights at a peace conference. Blockade, impressment. And he told the Americans the same thing. These were the bases of British power. Britain is a sea power, not a land power. Control of the seas is Britain's only strong arm. As a small, weak state, it maximized the strength of its navy. British naval power kept the American war and the European war apart and condemned President Madison to a solitary conflict. Once the Americans had taken maritime belligerent rights off the agenda, peace could be discussed at Ghent, a town in Belgium, then occupied by British troops. They might as well have had the treaty in Britain. The Americans resorted to some interesting mechanisms to defeat the Royal Navy, but the British were not hugely impressed. Blow up my hull indeed. You may kiss my um, taffrail, Mr. Yankee Doodle, <laughs> says uh, Jack Tarr. Not impressed. Here is a German cartoon of the downfall of Napoleon. He went from Emperor of the World to Emperor of Elba, which is a very small island. <laughs> and the Germans loved this. Here is the main player in our story. This is Admiral Sir George Coburn's officially commissioned portrait. This is how he wished to be remembered. This isn't accidental. This is the man telling us about himself. He clearly thought this was one of his more important events. As we know, the occupation 
of Washington and the destruction of the public buildings was a major event. But more important, it sparked a run on the American banks. Everybody who had any cash took it out of American banks and put it into Canadian banks in British government securities, which paid better uh, and weren't defaulting. On October the 4th, the United States became insolvent. A month later, it defaulted on the terms of the Louisiana uh, Purchase. Yet neither the destruction of Washington nor the defeat at Plattsburgh of British forces had any serious effect on British policy. The British offered status quo ante because they just wanted the war to go away, even after the downfall of Napoleon. There was not a war here they wished to fight. And the peace treaty signed on the 24th of December 1814 at Ghent was little more than a recognition of that fact. Here is some of Coburn's handiwork, and here's some more of it. Uh, the Battle of North Point, an interesting event, but far more important, the signing of the Treaty of Ghent. By the time the treaty was signed, the United States was in default by three million pounds, 15, three million dollars, 15 million dollars were then outstanding on interest payments. The national debt rose by 200%. Little wonder that Canada demands to end impressment and abrogate British maritime belligerent rights were abandoned. There would be two more battles. Battle of New Orleans, you've all heard of. This one is the one that's not in the textbooks. The British captured the American flagship, the USS President of Sandy Hook, on the 15th of January 1815, in another action in which both captains fought brilliantly, but the British captain was more brilliant. It is no accident that the headquarters of the Royal Navy in London is HMS President. It is the direct descendant of this ship. And when you walk into the mess, if you stop before you get to the bar, you will see four engravings of this battle. This is the one the British remember. This is Lord Castlereagh's map of the War of 1812. Uh, this is what 1812 is all about, not interfering in the settlement of Europe. The Congress of Vienna created a peaceful, stable European state system that was open for business and unlikely to lead to another major conflict. That was Britain's war aim. In the whole course of 22 years fighting the French, the British took from the rest of Europe two very small islands, one in the Mediterranean called Malta, the other one in the North Sea called Heligoland. That is Britain's entire access of European territory in this war. They gave it all up for peace and stability. And then, of course, Napoleon came back, but not for long. He was rapidly arrested after the Battle of Waterloo by Admiral Sir Henry Hotham, the man who'd run the blockade of New York for the previous two years. When the war was over, the Republican Party did what you normally do as a political organization when you've presided over a failure. They declared it a great success. <laughs> And the Republican Party's uh, speechwriters, their newspaper men, and everybody else celebrated a great victory, and they erected a great arch of victory, three frigate victories in New Orleans, the standard uh, War of 1812 version, which came down through the years. So Walter Scott, who understood how to create fabulous stories, realized what the Americans were doing, and rather regretted they hadn't been taught a more severe lesson. Uh, but he realized the British weren't prepared to fight a war for such nebulous objects as teaching lessons. He knew that the American pens would create the victory that had eluded their swords. And he also understands that the enduring legacy of 1812 would be not territory, not maritime belligerent rights, but a distinct American culture. The War of 1812 forced the United States to face up to itself and recognize that it wasn't part of something else. It was of itself. It was a country that would have its own culture. It would paint its own pictures. It would write its own stories. It would create an American identity. And this war is the spark from which that emerged. The war drove America to acquire a distinctive new world identity, one that privileged landscape, scale, and the westward opportunities over the narrow confines and dusty histories of Europe. Perhaps the fiery destruction of a classical mansion was the conflict's most appropriate metaphor. Thank you very much. We now have a short in opportunity for some questions and answers, and I'd be more than happy to do some questions. Please. <laughs> 
how did American finances recover after the war? Was the resumption of uh, trade duties sufficient to refill the treasury? Did we uh, undefault on the loans? Yep. The economic problems of the United States were ended by the conclusion of peace. It opened up the international money markets to America. It also persuaded American financiers that there was something worth investing in. If you've just seen the capital city trashed and the government fleeing, you really don't think this country is something you want to invest in long term. So the resumption of peace opens up the domestic taps. It also leads to a massive boom in trade. All of that trade that didn't happen from 1812 to 1815, it happens pretty much as soon as the war ends. News of peace in London prompts every merchant in the whole of the United Kingdom to load ships up with goods that they think will sell in America. And this huge armada of trade crosses the Atlantic, and all of a sudden the, West, the East Coast ports are flooded with goods business booms again. There's then an economic setback, but essentially the United States is able to recover its equilibrium and rebuild its economic activity in the aftermath. So peace is really good for business. It's really good for the economy. Uh, war is not. Uh, it's a lesson the British had learned many years before. Uh, go, to the, go to the mic, please. Yep. Good question. Yes. Um, have you seen in the, what I always call public record office, what? Is that Mike coming? Sorry. Have you seen uh, in the public record office any orders uh, to Coburn and Ross to burn the public buildings in Washington? And uh, the implication being retaliation, question mark. Yeah, thank you very much. This is one of the great questions about what happens in Washington. Were Coburn and Ross operating under specific orders to do something as specific as burning the, the White House. Uh, certainly, there was a sense that after the occupation of what is now Toronto and the destruction of the public buildings there, and in other parts on the Niagara Front, where there'd been some cross-border destruction of public and private buildings by both sides, uh, that the public buildings of the state that had started the war were fair game. And nobody in Europe would have thought this was in any way surprising. The whole operation was organized by George Coburn. He was the only man among those in command who'd been here for long enough to work out what the target was and how to get there. Uh, the chronology is quite clear. The army with Ross and Alexander Cochrane arrives in the Chesapeake, and the next morning they set off up the Patuxent and land and march ac across towards Bladensburg. It's Coburn's operation, and he is responsible for everything that happens. He had no problem with that, but he didn't have specific orders to do it. Uh, his boss, Alexander Cochrane, uh, was very supportive. Cochrane had lost his elder brother in the Revolutionary War uh, and harbored some dislike of Americans uh, as a consequence of that. Uh, it was a very divisive war, and there were many on the British side who were old enough to remember that conflict. They'd fought in it either as young men or, in the case of Alexander Cochrane, as a ship captain in the Royal Navy. So memories of the last war were still very strong. They were quite raw for many people. Uh, you, me uh, you mentioned the uh, burning of the government buildings, but uh, we've heard it often said that no private buildings were, set, were burned. But uh, Pamela Scott showed me a, a drawing the other day that I had noticed before, um, but hadn't thought about in this context. A drawing by Latrobe in December of 1815 that shows George Washington's build, buildings burned, the ruins of them, and a large tavern nearby, near the capital, that was also in ruins. Uh, this is a year after the British were there, and it seems as though they must have done the burning. Uh, thank you for that. Were, did the British destroy any other buildings in Washington other than the public buildings? The one private building they destroyed was a building from which a sniper shot General Ross's horse, um, obviously missing General Ross, who I think was the target. The British didn't burn the building because it was part of a terrace, so they pulled it down. Uh, they also destroyed the offices of the National Intelligence, but any sound a general and admiral would like to see the press suppressed. <laughs>
George Coburn took all of the letter C's out of the compositor's box so they couldn't write any more scurrilous articles about him. <laughs> the, uh, the intelligence I had frequently compared him with Satan and not to Satan's advantage. Uh, so he, he took a, a particular delight. He then decided he hadn't done enough, so he got the press out and burnt that as well. Uh, remember that in the aftermath of that occupation, there was a tremendous storm and there was a lot of damage done by the storm as well. So there, that may have been storm damage. But there's, there's certainly no record of the British deliberately destroying any other private buildings. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, when, as part of the Coburn's operation and Ross's operation, of course, there was the squadron under Captain Gordon which came, ascended the Potomac River, a rather remarkable adventure in itself. And as they came up and before they engaged Fort Washington, they sailed by Mount Vernon, mm -hmm. the very symbol of America with George Washington. Why didn't they just blow up Mount Vernon? Thank you very much. Um, tomorrow evening, I'm going to be speaking in the Masonic Hall in Alexandria about that very operation. Um, <laughs> The reason the British didn't blow up Mount Vernon is because George Washington was a liberal hero. Uh, as far as British liberals, on the, certainly on the left of politics, were concerned, George Washington was a very significant figure in the creation of British democracy. He taught the British some very important lessons about representation. So they didn't burn the building. They stopped, and the band came up, and they played Washington's March in his honor. So the British were not making war on America. They were making war on the American government. Uh, and they recognized that half the population of America were not enthusiastic about this war. Uh, the Federalist response to the war was, was not particularly engaged. Uh, they saw that this was very much a, a partisan conflict within America, and they very carefully targeted those Americans who they believed to be the causes of the war, hence the use of the Congressional Division List. So George Washington, he's off limits. He's part of the history of Britain and America. Remember, he's a He's an officer in King George's army first, and he is spared, as are almost all public buildings, the British can, uh, private buildings, that the British can spare. Thank you. One there and one there. Uh, why don't you go first? Okay. While the uh, at one point, was part of the British war aims for uh, concluding the, the conflict to create some sort of a Native American territory in the old uh, Northwest, and, and what happened to that? for it to go status quo ante? The British government's position on the peace treaty was not entirely unified. The British minister who was most involved in running the war, the Secretary of State for War, the Earl of Bathurst, was also responsible for British colonies. And his view was that it would be a really good idea if we could build some kind of buffer zone between the United States and British North America to reduce the possibility of future conflict. And the Native American peoples were seen as, as, as an ideal opportunity to do this. His cabinet colleagues disagreed vehemently. They didn't want to spend 10 million a year to improve the border of Canada. Bathurst was outvoted. And then the, the international lawyers started to look at the problems of creating a buffer zone which belonged to a people who had no residential qualifications and did not have any national identity. And it, at law, it would have been almost impossible to have created a territory to give to the Native Americans. There was simply no framework to do this. Um, European legal systems did not recognize the rights of Native peoples, uh, which is how you're able to sweep right west across the whole of the continent, because there, there was no legal framework for giving them national identity. So it was an idea, it was mooted, and it was used as a way of pushing the Americans away from talking about maritime belligerent rights. The British put something up which they had no intention of, of trying to execute because it was inchoate. There was no particular form that you could give this. It was a kind of line somewhere out in the northwest, but it was never determined what that line was, who was inside it, how it would be policed. So it was a great negotiating position because it made the Americans think they'd won something. But what the British had done is make the Americans worry about something which they couldn't care about, and in exchange they got maritime rights off the treaty table. 
So it's a nice, it's a nice way of everybody feeling they've won something. But there was no way that this could have been set up. We would have to have agreed, Washington and London, that the Native American peoples were a nation and that they had a national identity uh, rather than being tribal peoples who were spread across the countryside in a completely different way. So, question there. Uh, maybe you, uh, okay. Uh, there's a William Charles cartoon, uh, or pair of cartoons, one lauding Baltimoreans and the other condemning the Alexandrians for provisioning the British fleet. I wonder if you could comment on yeah. Yeah, William Charles, the, the famous cartoonist who makes fun of the Alexandrians, he actually lived and worked in Alexandria, and he was British, um, but obviously a British Republican. Uh, his cartoon is very much the Republican view of the Alexandrians, which was very unpleasant. And he then used the Baltimore cartoon as a way of showing that the British could be beaten. Of course, the British weren't beaten at Baltimore, they just decided they didn't want to... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you want to start Baltimore, we can do it. Um, th there are 20,000 Americans dug in in a very strong position at Baltimore. The British have less than 4,000 ground troops. Um, how are they going to get into Baltimore? Um, the British didn't have another army, so if they burnt their army up attacking Baltimore, they had no more troops left. Um, we're curious about Alexandria. Yeah, with Alexandria, the, uh, the picture is, is quite clear. John Bull, who is a minotaur, um, a truly terrible mythic beast, um, has got the, the citizens of Alexandria on their knees with their hair standing up on end, uh, as indeed your hair would if you saw a real minotaur. Um, but the British sailors are saying, we need to get out of here before those American naval heroes turn up. You know, um, John Rogers and um, David Porter and Oliver Hazard Perry. Of course, they did turn up and they tried to stop the British leaving, but they failed. Um, British got back. Uh, after some interesting exchanges of fire. So it's a very important political cartoon, but you have to read it as very much a partisan cartoon. It's just like the Shannon Chesapeake cartoon I showed. It's one side of the argument, but it's an internal cartoon. It has no resonance with the British at all. This is the Republicans pointing the finger at the Federalists and saying, you're not patriotic. One more? I'd just like to say that the score is now even. This last weekend, the city of Alexandra challenged the Royal Navy to three sporting events, and the city <laughs> won all three. <laughs> I'm... Huzzah! I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that, but of course the score in frigates in the War of 1812 was three each. Uh, and as the British took all three of their prizes home, and the Americans only got one of theirs home, I think we get that one on points. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we will now take a short break, and we're going to start promptly, because C-SPAN 3 will be up and running at 2.15. So if you can be in your seats, ready to go, it'll be a wonderful following talk. Thank you so much. live at the Decatur House in Washington, D.C., the uh, first part of a two-day forum with historians and authors marking the anniversary of the British burning of Washington and the War of 1812. Andrew Lambert uh, concluding his remarks. The conference uh, expected to return a little less than a half hour, maybe about 25 minutes or so from now, 2.15 Eastern time. And coming up next is uh, Catherine Allgore, who's written a book about Dolly Madison. Later on in the three o'clock hour, Alan Taylor, author of The Civil War of 1812. And closing out this first day will be John Stagg, editor of the Madison Papers at the University of Virginia.
More programming about the War of 1812 tonight at 8 with a re-airing of this first day of the conference hosted by the White House Historical Association, U.S. Capitol Historical Society, and James Madison's Montpelier. Looking ahead to tomorrow, live coverage of the conference continues at 8.30 a.m. Eastern Time here on C-SPAN 3's American History TV. The lineup of uh, authors includes Donald Hickey, Steve Vogel, both have uh, written books about the War of 1812, and Holly Shulman, who is the editor of the Dolly Madison Project at the University of Virginia. That's all in the morning. And tomorrow afternoon, uh, the session features Kenneth Bowling, Pamela Scott, William Steele, and appearing together, Andrew Ber uh, Burstein and Nancy Eisenberg, who are the co-authors of Madison and Jefferson. All of that ahead on C-SPAN 3's American History TV. Again, the conference uh, will continue in about uh, 20, 25 minutes from now. Until then, while we're waiting for it to resume, a look at the Battle of Bladensburg during the War of 1812. First of all, I want to welcome everyone to uh, this roundtable discussion on the War of 18.